Hello there, and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 408. That's 408 of the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga. How are you guys doing? How are you guys feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? Muscle menace, you know, doing a damn thing, holding on as best as I can, and trying to make the best of a very bad situation. If it's your first time tuning into the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and of course, leave me a comment down below. Um, if you have seen the show via YouTube, you should be seeing some timestamps at the bottom of the little bar. So if you kind of scroll along, you can kind of jump into different sections that I talk about. So if you're not, you know, you don't want to watch the whole thing, then definitely do that. And of course, you know, um, I do upload all the clips on the channel too. So make sure you check that out and you give those clips a good little like and a good little comment. So it helps the algorithm spread it out and get out there. And of course, if you're listening via the podcast app a five star review and a download and a share will go a long way to help spread the word and get it out there too and of course support for your patrons always more than welcome you get one bonus show on there only for patreon subscribers so make sure you jump on patreon and subscribe it's patreon.com for just agostino it's only one pound only one dollar a bonus show only available on patreon make sure you access that and get on there before it's too late um i've got one dollar and one pound kind of levels and i think there's only about a hundred of them so make sure you jump on there before those all run out that's patreon.com forward slash agostino patreon.com forward slash agostino slash or slash whatever you say that term it sounds a bit weird when i'm saying on the speaker but hey, microphone speaker speaker microphone speaker whatever anyway regardless here we are and i'm still i'm not gonna lie i'm still kind of pissed off about united result you know um getting knocked out of champions league against rebel leipzig is no um, embarrassment i guess considering our previous um run outs in the champions league right what was the worst feeling getting knocked out by seville and then having Mourinho tell us that we should expect it because we're shit getting knocked out by wolfsburg was probably a bit of pill to swallow because we led i think we were in the lead we scored a, cre- a pretty early goal and then we drew on one and then they scored again and then we drew to make it level and then they scored last minute. So that was pretty painful. But this is pretty difficult to take considering how well we started, right? We win, you know, we 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 beat Red Bull Leipzig 5-1, I think, right? 5-0, sorry. Then we beat Paris Saint-Germain, I'm going to say, at home. And you're just thinking, okay, you got two of, the, two of the biggest tests out the way and you're just assuming you're going to be able to qualify. And then towards the end, all we needed was, what, one point from three games or something? We didn't get nothing. Like... It just beggars belief, isn't it, how crap we've been in Europe, um, especially considering all the work and all the money that was put into making sure that we get back into the Champions League. And then we just kind of went out without a whimper, like really hot, disheartening to take. And now you're hearing all these reports, you know, um, Solskjaer is looking like the guy that's going to be there for the long term, which, you know, is really... Eh. I don't really have, you know, I don't have any, I, I can understand, like, as much as I don't like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer guys, you know, I manager and I think we can definitely get better in terms of standard, in terms of quality, in terms of pull for players, because that's really important as well, in terms of, you know, brand of football on a consistent basis, I know there's better out there for sure, he's not the be all and end all, no way, shadow or form, Um, I'm also not that mad if they decided to like, hey, give him another season, right, but they haven't given him the tools or the the players needed or the structure needed for him to, to him to succeed in the first place. We still don't have a director of football. And I'm not too sure if that's Solskjaer's doing. If he's actually said, hey, I don't want a director of football. I want to do it on my own because he kind of thinks he's a mini. He's, he thinks he's like Sir Alex Ferguson reincarnated. He's always talking about um, having chats with Sir Alex Ferguson and all this sort of stuff and being all ultra nostalgic, which is always a little bit of recipe for disaster. But let's say that's the case and he decided not to, or let's say we are, we kind of hear through the grapevine that we are trying to hire one, but we just haven't got around to doing it. I don't understand giving him more time if you're not going to give him the structure for him to thrive. You're not going to give him the players that he needs or the checkbook. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. Like if that's the case and you want someone to operate under, um, you know, a restricted budget, um with probably not much time to develop a squad or to implement a style of play which you know two seasons maybe some people would argue it's enough time two seasons more than 250 million spent but regardless right if if that's the case and football's moved on you're never going to give a manager five years or whatever to implement their style of play fair enough 
then just get in the person that can do the job right and limit the amount of errors that you make in that process by like i said h hiring somebody like a director of football or a sporting director who's going to maybe lay out the blueprint and the plan for what we're trying to achieve overall over like a maybe five to ten year plan the same way liverpool and man city did even before pep guardiola arrived right they were signing players um to fit pep guardiola's style of play before he was even at the club so united needs to do something like that so that even if the managers do fail individually you could just replace them with somebody else who sort of has the same sort of ethos and way of looking at football and just you let them operate underneath that sort of structure but at the moment we don't have that we just have this approach where we kind of hire one guy he brings in his whole team and a way of the way he kind of wants to play football and where he approaches transfers and all this sort of stuff and then once that one guy fails or succeeds another one comes in it's just it's a complete shit show really um so yeah i don't know man like the noise is coming out at the moment post united getting you know getting uh, crashed out of the champions league so far is that soul shark is either you know lost the dressing room with some players which i definitely agree with i think i can definitely believe that rumor that people like bruno fernandez and stuff you know they're not going to stand for having they're not going to stand for playing in the europa league season in season now at man united right they came to united to win you know titles domestic titles domestic trophies and european cups you know of the caliber of the champions league they didn't come here to play europa league football they would have just stayed at sport in lisbon or whatever and that's not going to happen so people like that i can assume especially if you consider at the beginning of the season there were rumors or rumblings when we were sort of uh, in our in our uh, you know you know however many inconsistent run of form uh, of games there were rumors out there and um, things people saying that supposedly you know Bruno Fernandes wasn't happy of, about the level of coaching at United and um, which is ironic because you know the main reason why Pogba wants to leave the club is because we don't really have ambition and we haven't really surrounded him with quality players for him to thrive, right? And ultimately the coaching hasn't been maybe up to par to what he's maybe used to. So for these same, you know, uh, pain points to be repeating themselves year in, year out, there's definitely a problem above the manager and above some of the maybe uh, public people that we saw see all the time. You know, there's things probably outside of our purview as United fans that are really affecting our ability to get back to the top. And unless those things are addressed, it's just I just fear it's going to be the same thing. I'm hopeful somebody like a Pochettino, right, a better coach who's demonstrated what he's done at Southampton. You know, who's demonstrated his ability to coach better uh, players of a lesser talent to a higher level at Southampton. The same thing at Tottenham, right? You're hoping someone that could come in and just take these players and sort of like you know with a few additions here and there. Um, some time on the training pitch be able to really get us playing a style of play that will allow us to slowly you know in increments and steps be able to progress and get better and better but evidence has shown so far um you know with previous managers that that's just not going to happen it's just not going to happen so um i don't know I, I i remain somewhat optimistic but i'm also realistic to the idea that hey we're shit for a reason. These things don't happen overnight. Um, and it's going to take a while for us to recover and get back to where we need to be. But hey, so far, what can you do about that one? Anyway, I mean, enough football talk because, you know, that gets a bit boring over time. But, you know, it's only <laughs> it's been the one bit of respite that I've been having, you know, over this prolonged period of time indoors. And so far, it looks like um, that bit of respite has kind of bit me in the ass, you know but what can you do what can you do anyway jumping into some topics here um interesting story i saw on bbc news regarding london and the potential of us entering into tier three now if you're not aware in the uk we are out of region well no we're out of national lockdown which basically meant you know as most countries you couldn't go to uh bars and hang out in you know in big groups and stuff and you could only do the usual things that go to a supermarket and maybe hang out with maybe one household whatever and it's varying levels of lockdown but that's basically what we had now we've sort of split up into like a regional lockdown where we have different tiers um f uh, one being obviously the least restrictions and three being the highest restrictions and most places with the exception of maybe three or four Four, maybe three or four places are in tier two and tier three 
now the problem in the uk is that there seems to be a bit of a north south divide growing or maybe um cementing itself in some way shape or form of a covid of the covid response because it seems like the government which is you know reconvenes mostly in the house of commons here in london has effectively ignored parts of the northeast or most parts of the north um uh, and really gone out of their way to kind of kind of withheld support in some way shape or form and it seems like that's the case because when they did all the tiers and they split them up they allocated most of the tier three or most of the tier three and tier two places up north and then obviously gave london the tier two which allows us to go to bars and pubs and restaurants and cinemas you know indoor events are okay you can go and watch your local football side outdoors and all that good stuff right um but judging by what happened the previous weekend where we just had tons of people going out who you know probably had a bit of cabin fever and just couldn't handle staying indoors for another day it looks like all of that kind of excitement at the fact that we're in tier two might effectively get us back into tier three which is kind of a lower version of the national lockdown which will then require you to not be able to go to shops but you could still go to places like gyms so i'll be happy in that regard but i was just thinking if they don't put london into tier three with the numbers going up as the experts are predicting right if this is the case because again i don't agree with it but whenever the numbers go up we just go into lockdown if they just do what they did in the past or if they don't do what they did in the past with other places across the uk if you live outside of london you're going to be really pissed off you're going to be really really angry especially parts of you know places like manchester and stuff yeah or maybe Nottingham in places where they've been under some of the tightest restrictions since March, right? They've been living under the tightest restrictions. So to be, so kind of look down um, at your neighbours in London and see us, you know, hordes of people jam-packed in the streets of Soho and central London in parts of East and South London. And only then for them, only for us to still be in tier two and not go in tier three is going to be really annoying, isn't it? I would assume so. Anyway, article here from BBC describing some of um, what I'm talking about. It says the following, coronavirus London must enter tier three, one experts. And of course, you see a leading picture here on the article with tons and tons of people in central London. Of course, most of the cars, I guess, are banned from going on some of these streets. Maybe look like a bit of Piccadilly. So people are taking advantage of it. And I remember talking the other day, I think I said to somebody, um that i'm pretty sure a lot of these shoppers that went to central london probably didn't even buy nothing it's just the idea of just going out and being surrounded by strangers was just so appealing you know there's only so much time you can spend indoors talking to flatmates partners and stuff you just need to go out and kind of feel um strangers uh bodily vibes right reverberating off of you right the chitter chatter and the commotion of strangers rustling around you excuse me bumping in running over the road crossing shouting screaming i bet most of that i bet most of the traffic was that just people just went out of a walk and do a bit of window shopping um in all intents purposes anyway the articles are following London should be placed in tier 3 now to avoid a spike in deaths over Christmas. Experts have warned the city saw a spike in COVID-19 cases at the end of the England-wide lockdown on December 2nd. New figures have, relieved, have revealed. Sorry, Government officials are due to meet on the 16th of December to review that tier each area should be allocated. Professor, jo Professor John Alston, author of The Blinded by Corona, said if the London doesn't want hospitals to be full over Christmas, the government need to get a grip today. This will go into start to look death deaths will start going up during the christmas period and new year unless something is done he said london could become a super spreader sending coronavirus to other parts of the country over christmas and making a third wave of infections likely in january um continues here london always gets treated differently from the rest of the country because that's where the parliament is and where a lot of the business community is and that's very true we've definitely seen that i think i didn't really believe that was a thing prior to covid i thought the whole like north south divide thing was just a bit of an urban myth or things people just work up in their heads but considering some of the treatment some of the preferential treatment we've got down here um vis-a-vis -vis some of my brothers and sisters up north i can definitely see where people kind of have that uh, you know can't believe that way of thinking um like, of course you got here a graph showing how the numbers have gone up it continues here said phe data shows that 21 of london's 32 boroughs have infection rates higher than the overall rate in england of 150 cases per 100,000 people jesus um taken together london's out outer boroughs have infections rates of 205 cases per 100,000 higher than the current rate in leicestershire test valley or bristol all of which are in tier 3 restrictions so 
it looks like unless things change, like we're definitely going to be in tier three for the new year, which is something that I would remind a lot of people, especially if you're a London based, like prepare your mind for it. Like try and I don't know. I think some people are still of this optimistic idea that we're somehow going to get back to normal next year straight away. That's not going to be the case, even with the vaccine. So be prepared for us to be in and out of lockdowns for the most part for them you know for the majority of the new year especially as they roll out the vaccine um to uh, uh, the people in need and all that malarkey um but of course in the interim the last thing we need is a massive spiking numbers and people you know overwhelming the health services and all that malarkey and then the people that actually need the vaccine not being able to get it that would really be um a, a kind of unfortunate uh, con conclusion to this um, really ineffective lockdown strategy that we've had in the first place right lockdown hasn't been the best hasn't really worked that well but now that we're kind of just about approaching the finishing line the last thing we need is a cook up towards the end I would assume it continues here it said Havering in East London has a rate of 362 per 100,000 from the 723rd lockdown restrictions will be eased to allow free households to meet up until for five days over Christmas that's looking like a really bad idea considering the numbers but again people need to see their family so it is what it is people can mix in homes places of worship and outdoor spaces and travel restrictions will be eased um the risk associated with Christmas are huge even without the rise, Dr. Mike Jill, former regional director of the public health for the Southeast region, said um, people should take steps to vastly reduce their contact. A tier three lockdown will contribute to this very slightly. Otherwise, you'll see hospitals admissions rise. And we know that proportions of those who are hospitalized die. We need lockdowns because um, there has been a complete failure to get a robust suppression strategy through track and trace, which has been one of the again you look at places like australia i said before in the other show like australia are back to normal without a vaccine right just through track and trace social distancing staying in homes limiting the spread by not you know crossing state lines or this malarkey they've been able to you know suppress the spread of covid just through being sensible and having a bit of civic duty and look at us look at us waiting to go to christmas markets everyone wants their mold wine right that's the most important thing mayor sadiq khan said here said there was question marks about the timing of the placing strict restrictions before Christmas break, Mr. Khan said there's growing speculation um, among politician uh, political leaders in the capital that London needs to move to tier three or highest tier. Some questions um, whether it would be effective for London to move to a tougher tier for only a few days before the festive period when conditions are being loosened across the country. Mr. Khan urged Londoners to follow the rules to avoid a further surge in cases. A Department of Health spokesman said tiering uh, decisions are based on the range of criteria, including how quickly case rises are going up and down, cases in the over 60s, pressures on NHS and local circumstances. The government will review the tiering allocation every 14 days and the areas will move into a downward tier based on those indicators from local areas so i guess by next week we'll have an indication i guess is that 14 days yeah it should be about 14 days next week right end of next week we should have an idea as to whether or not london will be in tier two or tier three so the highest tier but it's most likely looking at that's going to be the case man so if you're in london definitely strap on in and get the most as what well, get get the most as you can out of this week um and then you know going forward it's going to be a bit of a bumping ride bumpy bumpy ride and of course in the old americas there's um there's still these um crazy you know lunatic fringe anti-mask brigade people around right I, I thought this kind of died out right i don't know why i thought that maybe i was a bit being a little bit um naive in my thinking but i just assumed people would just kind of i don't know we're all kind of we've all reached a stage collectively i think you know as a uh, as global citizens right we've all reached a stage i think for the most part where we just want to get back to normal right we've been under restrictions for way too long in some places the virus seems to be accelerating if not decreasing in its spread um across your state or country so for the most part everyone's kind of used to the rules you're used to what you kind of have to do and you kind of do the bare minimum in order for you to kind of live a normal a quasi normal life right people are basically doing it so you might take some liberties and go to your friend's house you might hang out someplace where you're not meant to hang out you might go get some food over there do a bit of a lock-in over there cheeky thing maybe set up a party here i don't know whatever travel to some place everyone's doing what they can do within the rules to kind of have some sort of sense of enjoyment 
And you'd imagine places like, you know, shops, you know, Target, supermarkets, restaurants, fast food chains would be the bare minimum of places where you just know how to just get around what needs to be done just so you can just get your thing and go. So this video is really interesting because this auntie mask Karen, as it's been dubbed, is walking in. I don't know if it looks like a Target or some sort of supermarket in the United States and they are purposely being obtuse and, and kind of refusing to wear a mask because it's there, I guess, um, right not to. But then they also don't understand that it's the right of the business to refuse service if you don't abide by the rules that they dictate for you to kind of shop. And if one of the rules is just to put a flipping face covering just, ab uh, just above your nose, that shouldn't be too much hassle, really, especially if you're going to just buy a couple of knickknacks in the supermarket. Really, shouldn't it? It shouldn't really be a bit of an issue, should it? It shouldn't. But this video proves that for some people, it is. If you do not want to do it, ma'am, if you do not wear a mask, you can just leave. I don't want to hear this. I don't need to hear this. I'm asking you, please. Please, I am. So it looks like a that looks like a Five Guys. Sorry, it's not. It's not. It's not a. Uh, it's not a Target. So there's a young lady here with her phone doing the classic Karen pose. It's, I'm, I'm really bummed out. It's a black girl, but you know it doesn't really matter her skin color. But that's a bummer. She's got her phone out recording the what do you call them? The burger master behind the, the Five Guys at the till. The guy on the the. the the, the cashier sorry at five guys and they're having a back and forth argument where he's recording her too with his phone um which is obviously good because you know he's an employee and the last thing you need is for some you know entitled customer to make it seem as if you were rude or you said something untoward or you weren't professional or whatever and then get you in trouble right you don't want to work there in the first place and you got a job that pays the bills and just allows you to live your life the last thing you need is some entitled so-and-so coming in and you know getting you sacked especially at this in you know in the world we're living in at the moment and with the economy the way it is so it's a very ridiculous conversation that they're both having but more so for the on the customer's end using you because you will not wear a mask and you need to wear a mask to come in here. Lady, I have asthma. It's really bad. My inhaler's in my backpack. Do you want me to show it to you? <laughs> Lady, I'm telling you, please, just leave. Can you state your name? I'm on my left. <laughs> the whole stating your name thing too, like, what's that going to do? State your name so they can send it to corporate. And they, they, they it's, a, it's a big thing in America. Whenever you're in a argument with somebody that works in the service industry, you always threaten them with corporate. I guess that's head office, how we have it in the UK. And that was always a bit of a concern for me when I used to work in shops. Um, whenever someone would mention head office, it would kind of make you tremble. I guess it's different in the UK because we generally have manners and we generally kind of, I guess for the most part, I would assume most retail employees or people that work in the service industry probably have a far better experience per 100,000 than the American equivalent. I reckon if you got somebody from Five Guys America and Five Guys UK and you told them, hey, um, you know, rank your job satisfaction out of 10 for for sure the or to rank your job annoyance right levels i think the uk guy would definitely have their uk their annoyance levels much lower than the united states i don't know why the united states customers seem to have this idea i guess it comes from that mantra of like the customer's always right they have definitely have that more so over there and um, whereas in the uk if someone keeps up a fuss and they threaten head office you just give them what they need just so they can get out and they kind of understand that if they're using the threat of the head office they're using it just so they can get what they want whereas in the states it feels like the head office or corporate is more so i want to get you in trouble i want to get you fired i want to get procedures changed right so that sort of stuff where in the uk head office threat is more so like just get me my thing in this moment like i don't have my receipt i want a refund i threaten head office you just give me my refund it's less about i want to get you sacked i don't know I, I, that's my just general thinking from the outside looking in you can leave you can leave i don't need to you can leave before i have to call the cops i am the manager that's why i'm asking you please leave I will. I do not have to ask to answer that. I don't have to answer any questions. Okay, can you but you can leave. You can find that online yourself. And they can tell you <laughs> exactly. you need to wear a mask when you come in here. Both. And bless the guy too behind her. I'm sure that that looks like a boyfriend, a partner, a brother, uh, a cousin, and a nephew, whatever. Right? Somehow, you know, they come into that place together. I'd assume. And look at his face. He's just like, babe, can we go? If ever there was mind reading, that's what he'd be saying. Babe, come on, man. Oh, this is so long. What are you doing, man? Fucking embarrassing me all the time. And there's probably a thing when you're arguing with somebody, even when you know you're in the wrong, you just want to just see it to the end, innit? You just want to see it to the end. You want to, some, you're just somehow hoping that you can turn the tide of this 
um, absolute shit show of a situation you've got yourself into and then prove yourself to be the right one. But in this situation, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. I don't So what's a corporate number? Oh, it was it's not loading. What's it? Oh, it stopped loading. But you got you got the drift anyway. You get the drift in that regard. You got the drift. Corporate, um, <laughs> corporate dilly dance in a Five Guys. Just imagine being that person that's gonna get irate and start cussing people out of Five Guys. Just imagine what kind of person you are. What kind of human being you must be to do that to people. Like, it's just deplorable, really, in my opinion, anyway, personally. I'm not really a fan of that, but hey, what can you do? Next one, we've got another battle of the Karens, this time in the parking lot. Um, what was that theory about uh, people in cars feeling like their life was at risk? Like, I think someone explained something like, oh, why is there so much road rage? Or why do some, why do seemingly rational, level-headed people get completely out of their mind crazy whenever they're in a car all right um i've seen it happen when i would you know i don't have my own car because i'm a londoner most londoners don't have vehicles but for the most part whenever i've been in a car with somebody of the same age as i right you, and especially somebody that you know to be relatively level-headed it's comp it's really uh, um, eye-opening to see them drive because you just see a completely different side to them right um the things that they call out the sort of switch that they have in terms of revving up their kind of level of anger and frustration it's just like whoa relax chill out and you never get it until you get behind the wall then you realize okay cool i understand being in this like i don't know 10 ton um aluminium um, structure hurtling down a road at 50 plus miles per hour it's definitely a bit of um, a fright there's definitely a bit of a worry and you know attached to it right you know just scared for your life you want to ensure that you don't get yourself in any kind of unnecessary positions that are going to of course cost you your life so that might explain to some extent but these sort of like Karen and Karen freaks out freak outs are the best because they're not usually about anything right this one's about a parking lot and they've done the classic Karen thing where they both got their smartphones out recording each other and just bickering back and forth it's just an epic epic battle of wheels who will win we do not know let's play it and you park like an idiot you've been reported oh I already reported you too baby this is on the on the screen it says Karen gone wild tried to pepper me, um and I have some too out Karen out uh, out Karen a Karen I don't know oh, oh out Karen a Karen okay cool so I guess the the aggressor had pepper spray on them and this is this is a common thing you see in America where people argue over parking space in supermarkets I guess because. I'd understand it in some respects because I guess if you're in a, a Walmart or Target, most of these places are like on the outskirts of whatever state they're in. So they're usually massive, massive, massive places. And of course they have even bigger parking lots to accommodate all those shoppers that they plan to kind of welcome in through their doors. So it's probably advantageous for you to get your car as close to the exit as possible or as close to one of the exits as possible. Um, so hence why parking spaces become like a big thing, which is probably why they have a lot of arguments about people not you know, having um, disability badges on their cars and then parking in disabled spots. That's probably the thing, but it's a really big issue in America when it comes to, um, you know, uh, uh, road rage. So she put my life at risk and my child's <laughs> life at risk. You've been posted all over Temecula Todd. Okay. Then she, the child was at risk. She's coming to frame. If you listen to this just on a podcast, she's holding her phone up to, you know, and recording the other lady. And then she holding her child's hand. And of course, the child trying not to be in frame as much as possible and using the kid as a prop, you know, in order to further her argument. What absolute champions? Have you? And I wonder. I you on Facebook, I got ten thousand followers. I wonder if I was a black woman. I wonder if I was a black woman. The fuck out of my way. A black. <laughs> What's being black have to do with anything? These women are insane. Get away from my car. Six feet. You better six feet. back up. Six feet. You better back up. Oh, I got up. them too. You I better back up. up. I got them too. Someone call nine one one right now. Get away. Get away from my car. Six feet. Uh. What in the hell is going on? Six feet! Come on, Six feet! Get away from my car! Get away from my car! I always wonder what, what what's that person, whenever there's, there's a stage in the argument where they sort of go back and forth and then the other person starts tapping on the phone, what are they doing? 
are they calling 991 i mean 991 are they locating someone else's contact to call are they quickly uploading the footage onto social media what are they doing whenever they're tapping on the screens that i always want to know get away from my car I, I have a lady. oh it's 991 it is 911 <laughs> epic absolutely epic get away from my car stop it stop it it's like oh jesus what is wrong with these people what is wrong with these people but hey look <laughs> i love it i love it anyway moving on moving on um oh we should all pray for little baby in it well if you're a dude you should pray for little baby because i think we can all kind of I wouldn't say sympathize with his position but somewhat understand <laughs> an absolute crazy week and a half he's had in general right so little baby's obviously like i don't know he seems to be the people's champion right everyone seems to be rooting for him and wanting him to do well he's probably one of the most improved rappers on the scene he's come in and completely carried um you know atlanta on his back for the best part of a year or maybe two years maybe more so qc he's carried qc on his back for the last two years or so and really held down for that label and just did his own thing and you know featured on some songs put in some absolutely stellar verses great videos and really 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 improved his rapping ability i always was a fan of his rapping ability anyway regardless but he's really definitely improved over the last couple of years and it seemed like things were just going you know on the up up for a minute over the weekend or maybe the weekend just passed it was his birthday and he had this like lavish party with all these celebrities coming in handing him gifts james harden giving him a bag full of yum yums and whatever they are and you know money and a watch and all this diamonds and cars and clothes and just it was an absolute celebration of little baby's life and you got to see okay cool a lot of people have a lot of love for this guy he's definitely well liked in the industry so that was all happening and he was doing this alongside his beautiful influencer ig baddie girlfriend um jada right and they were having an absolute whale of a time um girls on the timeline being like couple goals i'm jealous guys being like, oh my god i wish i'm all buy me that stuff and everyone else in between just um you know kind of jealously happy for him then all of a sudden out of nowhere he just gets embroiled in some madness involving uh, a prostitute or a sex worker called miss london who effectively airs him out and basically says that you know even though he kind of puts his image out that he's a devoted man that he was supposedly acquiring her services for his birthday um and at first no one believed it i was like nah no way he wouldn't do that he's with his girl she's this is that and of course the person in question who you know uh, put out the accusations felt embarrassed so they went out of their way to prove that no it was in fact little, uh, little baby that reached out to her and they were kind of talking to each other via twitter and we got all the proof we needed via her screenshots and it's been basically proven that he did eventually end up paying what was it six thousand dollars or sixteen thousand however much i've seen online um for her services and um if you you know if you have a little dig through the timeline on twitter especially there are a lot of other guys who swear by how her good she is at doing what she does so i guess there's some relevance to it but god how embarrassing man for jada obviously he's rumored girlfriend at the time i'm not sure they're together anymore but what an absolute shit birthday week he's had an absolute terrible one i guess for the prostitute involved miss london she's probably loving it right it's been a probably good time for her she's probably thinking hey i've had a way all of the time um boosted her rep probably got her followers up probably increased her only fan subscription amount or however many people are on there but god almighty what an absolute shit show of a situation so it's a headline from hot 97 it says miss london issues an apology to little baby and girlfriend jada it says miss london issued an apology after she claimed little baby paid her a large amount of money to have a, a relate to have relations with her um he says she says on twitter okay so this is what she said actually i got it here on the shade room so she said the following this is what she said about the whole situation clearing out the air there was a small misunderstanding of what i said i was drinking but what i said was factual dates were just not aligned and he was pissed i apologized and we were supposed to fix it in the public does the baby love his girl yes so this is not really adequate i think if you're a sex worker or a prostitute and you engage in some sort of dealings with a married or a guy in a relationship it doesn't even matter what he's in you i would assume part of your profession is that you just take that shit to the grave 
There is no divulging. There is no tell-all book. There is no confessional. It just is what it is. It's your job. It's incandescent. It's a bit seedy. It's underground. It's naughty. So it just doesn't get talk, talked about. Um, I wouldn't know. I've never really, in, uh, you know, partaken in such activities. But I would assume that if that is the case, that is what would it be in it? Because if not, what what would be the point of going to such people to get such services, right? Part of the reason why you'd go is for the anonymous nature of it is the hush hush just between me and you nature of it of course if you're someone of notoriety the person will know who you are but they'll keep that to themselves it will be like i would assume it'll be locker room talk um within their you know other peer group and people in their profession but to air it out just felt a bit it felt it stunk a bit of jealousy really if i'm honest again looking from the outside it seemed like she was you know remembering her times with him and thinking oh wow what a great guy if you get what i mean then she saw the posts on social media of him with his girlfriend hanging out having a great time she's probably just got a bit jealous she probably thought you know what i, I want to be that girl i want to be there too why am i the one that's hiding in secret drinking my 1942 on my own on my piles of cash you know in my uh uh plastic stiletto boots i should be at that party and then she just probably aired it out that way hoping no one would notice but of course the internet everyone's always looking and because um, uh, i think he got caught who said something i read something somewhere that he might have got caught out because he liked one of her pictures on social back in the day so people always had their eye out like you know where i guess there are those girls out there who exist who are kind of really big stands and fans of these sort of like ig baddies and they sort of follow them everywhere and they basically look out for them when they get into a relationship so some of these people were looking out and just checking what's going on so the moment she tweeted what she tweeted they kind of put two, two together like oh that's definitely little baby and you know he basically got in a situation that he couldn't really get himself out of in a really clean manner or explain in any sort of rational sense because how, how do you explain that you know there's no explaining this is no there's no fixing this really let's go back to the article from heart 97 it, of course it's got the uh, apology there um and uh, or she said she a baby loves this girl he's not out here acting crazy but men will be men listen under said <laughs> uh, but you got you got to keep it real we're all team little baby she said she's a good person maybe just horny and i was just drunk and speaking too loud my bad i tried to <laughs> do damage control on the internet was not having that feeling like with some but stop trending and let them be in love these people are she is horrible what a horrible person you've absolutely ruined his relationship destroyed his birthday week um you know probably left some emotional scars to the girl that she's probably gonna take a long time to heal from i'm pretty sure they'll probably end up getting back together jade and little baby anyway but regardless you've definitely impacted her life physically and mentally in a profound way and then the thing that she has to say here is advice for them to baby loves his girl he's not this, this uh, baby loves his girl he's not out here acting crazy but meant to be men uh, he's a good person maybe just only that could be something that could be attributed to most men right we could all kind of agree to that we could probably get that tattooed on our chest maybe he's a good he's a good guy maybe just horny right that could be a way to describe us all and then of course little baby to end said the following let my good outweigh my bad and keep pushing which is what you can all you can do really you just have to take the l on the chin and hope over time people forget people move on and you are allowed to kind of rewrite your wrongs in another way shape or form but so so embarrassing what an absolute shit show and again it started off so well everyone praising him for his gifts and being jealous that they don't have friends who buy them fatigues and ap's and give them you know bag full of flipping you know pastries and cash but hey sometimes um what's going on behind the scenes is uh not something that you'll be should be envied for the average everyday person but hey what can you do what can you do next on this what else do we have here what else is we to talk about oh yeah casanova interview so it's been reported here by hot new hip-hop and a few other places that supposedly the case um around surrounding casanova the rico case that he's been indicted on um unfortunately he had to turn himself in a couple of days ago um it seemed like the feds in new york were basically um watching him and his crew and essentially build up an entire case alleging that he was involved in some gang activity you know um untoward and something that he should obviously be in involved in if he's a recording artist being given a second chance as he had done with rock nation and it's been reported here about new hip-hop that supposedly 
the feds were using footage and interviews that he did with Vlad to build up a case against him. And of course, social media is reacting to it and saying, hey, we should stop as a community of people, you know, uh, that are fans of the hip hip hop and hip hop culture and artists involved should stop going on Vlad and doing interviews because eventually, essentially, he's basically hamming people up and getting them in big, big trouble. So it's an article here from Hip um, Hot New Hip Hop says the following, Casanova interviewed Vlad used to indict rapper report. Twitter reacts to the reports that DJ Vlad's interview with Casanova would use to help uh, get the rapper jammed up. There are a few people in hip-hop who are de uh, definitely working with the feds. We can certainly count on Takashi 69 being amongst them. But for years, there have also been whispers that DJ Vlad has also been cooperating with authorities to help get rappers locked up. Vlad has denied this, though he has also joked about it on a few occasions, namely when he interviewed Lil Baby and brought up the fight the rapper had behind bars. So, he obviously isn't I don't think working, you know, hand in hand with the feds, but the way that he interviews rappers and probes and prods and goes through, you know, meticulous detail there, you know, um, past criminal history is really suspect. And for the most part, doesn't really serve the rapper's best interest. Um, of course, it's the rapper's fault in the first place for going on that platform and willing be and being willing to speak so openly about the crimes they've committed in an effort to basically bolster their street rep or whatever it may be. It's mostly their fault. But I do think there's some responsibility, especially when it comes to hip hop, especially when it comes to the idea of represent not representation, especially when it comes to the, um how um certain people within certain segments of society in america are treated by the police you're just giving them a reason to get these guys who are trying their best to pull away from the streets to pull away from gang culture which is really hard to get away from don't let anyone else de um, kid you on that regard you're making it really difficult for them to start anew and i guess you kind of do owe it to them especially considering the amount yeah, I would assume, to me talking from the outside and being a British guy, I would assume some people would argue with Vlad being an outsider, him being white, which is not an issue, but it is, he probably owes it to the culture to be a bit more respectful of the position that he has and to not try and get people and to not try and play any part in a situation that would get other black people put behind bars right that should just be it like you, you you're kind of been welcomed in as a guest you've obviously done your work he's done his rep he's he's got his ten thousand hours in you know he's been instrumental in uplifting some people's careers maybe denigrating others he's done the work there's no denying that he's not like a you know fly by night guy he's been in industry for a long time survived many um iterations of media evolved and adapted his skill set but there does come a point where you just have to be like okay cool maybe i just step away from these sort of sensationalized prison stories and past crime stories in an effort to uh, get these people jammed up because mm -hmm. eventually it's not going to serve me well either so it continues here it says earlier today it was revealed that vlad tv interviews with casanova that detailed the rapper's previous convictions have been used against him in a recent federal indictment per inner city press the media outlet that heavily covered cash 69's case casanova's admission of violence inside the prison facilities has been used to have him indicted which is absolutely insane you would assume there'd be some sort of like what you call it um you would assume I don't know why that why would that be an issue i'd wonder you got in prison you have a fight of course it's a bit of a violent one but you had it and then you get let out why would they use the fight again that you because you serve your time right are you I'd, I'd, I'd imagine most of the time if you're in prison and you have a fight you get put in a hole you get put in uh, you know social confinement whatever it is you get some form of punishment maybe you get days added to your sentence but whatever it is you serve your punishment out and you're a free man you should be allowed to speak openly about what you've done if you want to they, it could, shouldn't be used against you if you have like a traffic violation i'd assume but maybe that's where the um, justice system um is kind of fucked up in the states but this is the following um in the public interviews he has admitted to stabbing inmates whilst incarcerated again casanova you fucked up there on those charges and the government has recovered photos from his iCloud account of several firearms demonstrating his con continued access to weapons in addition to publicly promoting the gang and glorifying activities senior is also a drug supplier for the gorilla stone oh yeah yeah, yeah. 
Um, anyone who's followed his career familiar with the Vlad TV interviews where Casanova explained alleged acts of violence and within a prison facility, as well as the status um, within Brooklyn. Plenty of people were not happy with the news turning um, turning Vlad into a top trend on Twitter. Needless to say, Twitter is urging rappers to skip out doing press with Vlad. Here's some examples, of course, people commenting on it. Please stop doing interviews with Vlad from Scotty Beam. Stop talking to Vlad from Fox Files. Uh, stop doing interviews with Vlad, said Banksy. Another guy here has got an uh, interview. Was that? Vlad don't even hide his shit. He deliberately tried to get people incriminated. When I, when I look at your music, when I listen to your music, and I look this is an interview with Pee Wee Longway, the, the infamous one where he sort of like refuses to basically comment on any sort of gang activity he did previously. Look at your but you know, I won't play that. Um, here you got a post from Chuck English who said, I knew Vlad interviews were sus when I noticed I was talking to a laptop. The nigga wasn't even in the room. He conducts that shit from a secret location. You never see his face. The drum set is a decoy. <laughs> LOL. And then you've got another post of someone doing the meme of, you know, asking um, random people on on the streets what they do for a living as a thing you got someone that have vlad done took more niggas down with feds oh yeah this guy too i forgot his name you run like that, that that's a very serious situation like I'm, I'm i'm assuming you know who the person is actually yeah, that sounds very personal actually i i never really find out who shot me because but well, i'll be into a lot of shit so i'm i keep it all real i robbed a couple of niggas took some bricks for some people mm -hmm. Recently, right? Well, actually, I was selling somebody some crack. And, um, I was serving somebody some crack. Nigga, I don't know what it's for. You know why? Because I kidnap niggas. I rob niggas. Jesus Christ, son. As much as Vlad is a, you know, a scourge of society, these rappers don't help themselves, do they? They don't help themselves. Another one, how many times we had to say DJ Vlad is a police. Um, and then I've got uh, Kevin on stage says the following. This is what Vlad looks like mad 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 but yeah i guess it's probably over for casanova unless he's somehow able to oh, there is a belief that he's just maybe getting hemmed up because he's a famous one they're just trying to indict him on this case on these charges because he's associated with the gang and he shouts them out and he's a famous high profile person and they're hoping that maybe he can maybe flip on his co-defendant in order to kind of reduce his time there is that weird thing where just if you're just associated with gang people, you get drawn in their charges, but it's not looking optimistic for me, man. It's not looking optimistic. So yeah, bang your doors, Casanova, and bang your bloody doors. What else are we going to talk about here? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we got this. It's funny. Rudy, Rudy Giuliani just got, he just got um, tested positive for COVID, right? Um, and then I think someone tweeted here. Oh, this is flipping hilarious. Uh, an absolute um, whirlwind of six weeks. This is from a person called, it doesn't matter what they call it, but it says that all of all within six weeks, what a legendary man. And you've got an image of Rudy Giuliani here lying on the bed trying to tuck his shirt into his trousers, um, obviously getting caught in that weird sting operation with um, uh, on the Borat 2 movie, which of course he was trying to say that it was him tucking in his shirt and not trying to reveal his private parts to this young lady, but we'll never know. And then of course the epic... Um, was it Hilton uh, landscaping spot that they were meant to, I think the story goes something along the lines of they were meant to do a press conference, you know, arguing about the election um, that Trump is alleging that he won. And uh, they were meant to go to some sort of uh, four se yeah, four seasons landscaping, right? They're meant to go to a four seasons in a certain location. They booked the wrong place and they ended up booking a landscaping factory place somewhere in the middle of bum fuck nowhere. And because they didn't want to, uh, they, they they were embarrassed that they got it wrong they just followed through and set up um a press conference there anyway regardless of the fact that they obviously didn't want to do the press conference there <laughs> which was absolutely hilarious um then of course you've got the epic moment where um Rudy Giuliani's hair dye was leaking um off the side of his face from him sweating under the lights when he was doing the first press conference I think when they were arguing about you know Trump winning the election which was a very funny moment for the interwebs and then of course you've got the farting twice as he was giving evidence during an election fraud hearing audibly too I think he's at that age though when you, you know when you're an older dude you just don't give a crap right um you know no pun intended um when you want to go you want to go um so and when it comes to farting in public the more natural 
you are with it, the more people tend to just kind of go with it as well and be like, oh, you know, if he's okay with it, I'm okay with it. And they don't seem to really react. So that really works in his favor. So I guess <laughs> big up Rudy Giuliani for that one. Absolute psycho, absolute legend. What else we have here? Ba, 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 ba. Should we move on to a couple of us maybe? Da, da, da. Oh, actually, yeah, let's move on to this. Because I think this is going to be an epic thing to basically add some more context to the story. So, as you guys are aware, Peggy Goo and Daniel Wang got into a bit of a tit tat. Well, tit for tat. Well, I guess Daniel Wang got in a tit for tat with Peggy Goo. Mostly, I guess, because he was um she was a bad neighbor right they kind of had a bit of a falling out personally and he detailed it in a very detailed facebook post where he basically alleged her to be a little bit of an entitled so-and-so right so it should be no surprise for most people who are you know um part of the culture you read between the lines you kind of had the feeling that most um you know djs of a certain status have a kind of inflated sense of self they're a bit self you know a bit self-absorbed narcissistic um <sighs> egotistical greedy money hungry whatever whatever it is right they're not the best of people so it shouldn't be no surprise that that will be the case of it but of course you know hearing a fellow dj somebody that is a peer somebody that's also very well respected in the dance music scene somebody that's well respected within the berlin scene coming out and laying it out to bear like this really makes you wonder like wow she must be a real pain in the ass in person for it to elicit that sort of response from somebody who appears to be pretty level headed now reading between lines of what i've seen online there's a lot of people complaining saying that daniel wang is essentially opening the doors to misogynistic attacks and um you know um just not being an ally to women and people of color who are essentially find it difficult to get a footing in industry in the first place and there's also a thinking that for there's also this cut weird kind of thing online where i don't know what what it is you see a lot in boiler room comments where there seems to be a little bit more spice and a little bit more pepper and a little bit more vitriol pointed towards female djs whenever they're playing badly or doing things that the commentators don't like whatever it may be right so you of course there's boiler rooms and live streams where you see a dj clanging or maybe playing a song that's a bit bait or just being crap at what they're doing right and there, there'll be comments pointing out right their sort of shortcomings as per usual right it's where the term string chin strokers comes from but there seems to be a little bit more vitriol pointing towards female DJs when they've done something wrong you see a lot with you know who's a good example the black madonna right or now she's what what is she now the black monday i don't know she changed her name but regardless right the, the she had a, a few viral moments where she you know did some pretty questionable and funny things but it felt like they went a bit above and beyond to take the piss out of her because she's a female that's what it felt like to me so there's some people arguing hey daniel wang we understand you've got issue with her but you doing this on facebook especially a platform like facebook where you know the some of the dance music fans on there haven't covered themselves in glory when you look back at some of the responses to the whole eric marillo case you open the case you open the gates for some of the more wankier of uh dance music fans to come out the woodwork and use it as an opportunity to tear women down in general and question their validity in the scene now i don't think it's that serious i just think people are taking the opportunity to kind of dunk on her because people are dunking on her and also some people just don't like her in general and use opportunity to of course kick her while she's down because why the fuck not so um that is the case and it's obviously a development peggy goose now responded but i just wanted to quickly go through some of the comments right that are on the the facebook post that he basically uploaded daniel wine because it's still on there and so far at the time of check-in right this is like an update on the time of check-in we've got more than two thousand comments more than two thousand comments from people um 9.9 9.8 reactions 3.8 related shares absolutely insane the amount of people that have something to say about uh peggy goo in general now does this mean that she's just widely hated i don't know i think it's probably 50 50 i think to be successful in any in any field you probably need as many people supporting you as you need people the as you need people who are detractors and kind of want to see your downfall i think it's sort of like that's how it sort of kind of works out from what i've seen observing it from afar but it is quite disconcerting i guess if you're peggy goo to see this amount of people really want really kind of reveling in your downfall it must be feel a bit weird and i wonder if you're daniel wang also do you feel a little bit 
is there an inch is there kind of a, a an ounce of regret that this tiny issue that you had with a local dj yeah they both live in berlin um asian descent thing probably doesn't matter but imagine that you know they're both from similar backgrounds maybe um i'd assume you know being a dj and working within the music industry isn't something both family members or you know members of their family are that much that approving of so they should have some sort of like shared experience thing that they can sort of like bond with he's obviously got a lot more experience in the scene she's obviously new there's things that they can kind of you know connect with you'd assume that they'd have a lot more um credit in the bank of each other to afford each other the benefit of doubt or maybe the benefit just to kind of hit them up directly so i wonder if you're the only one with it that you kind of regret putting this out there like that because yeah it's funny peg you does come across as you know not the bestest of persons but again some of the comments on it is are mad so you said look at look so uh, what, what, some of the comments here are crazy and one of the craziest comments again we'll jump back to the comments but one of the craziest comments i saw posted um was a actual reply from vakula who i've kind of featured on here before right and you'd know him previously because he was the guy that essentially made an album cover for one of his eps where he essentially depicted um some of the more prominent female djs in the scene like nina kravis peggy goo black madonna and somebody else i think i don't know who it was um he basically depicted them you know flying this like penis shaped space crash through space and all this sort of shit in a very kind of derogatory manner he got vilified for it got quasi counseled for the most part for like a year and a half and now he's sort of like really his ugly head um and he's basically kind of you know spouting off his nonsense out there and i so recently actually i saw an interview with him on some russian youtube channel that provided subtitles where he essentially said you know he basically was pretty un what's that thing called he was pretty uh he was pretty unremorseful about what he did previously with the album cover he basically said it was art and people took it too seriously and he essentially then went on to detail his um what he's basically close relationship right with <laughs> peggy goo in the past which i had no idea about and basically called her out for being a hypocrite and just went into mad details like bloody hell man and it was from last year but it hadn't been spoken about in any of the you know main dance music press pieces i think because it was in russian so no one really um was able to kind of translate it but i thought that was mad and then of course the cooler being a narcissist that he is came out and said it again in english now in the comments somewhere and um it says here michaeli uh, basically posted on his on his uh, page and his uh, here's his reply right to the, obviously the fred um sorry the post that um, daniel wang posted on his facebook and he says the following bakula he said i had a close relationship with her as as i fucked her basically dot 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 two times so i agree with every word you say if you're daniel wang surely you have to feel a little bit bad that you are being co-signed by the douchebags of all douchebags of Vakula. he's coming out essentially telling all her business putting it out that they fucked so like what 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 um use does this story serve why are you telling us that you, you had sexual relations with her why do we need to know this he's trying to obviously puff his chest out and you know kind of come across like a big boy but it just makes him look like an absolute wallad so he continued um she wanted me to make music for her which i suggested to do uh, to her to do it the, without any help when she started to be cap uh, capricious and left my house said that she would never come back to ukraine but later after two a few years she returned as a well-known pseudo disc jockey to play at a few uh, some club in kiev which again i don't like this there's this common theme that runs through this whole peggy goo situation where everyone's got a story to tell because they were her former friend but i don't know i get the impl i don't know this girl i've never met her in my life i don't give a shit about her personally right but i can tell from the outside looking at her, she looks like a pretty consistently uh normal she looks like she looks like she would she doesn't kind of hide who she is i think if you hang her out if you hung around her you know enough you'd probably get a vibe of who she is as a person it's no she doesn't suddenly turn into like you know dj bitch overnight she just is what she is and if you want to be a friend you want to be a friend so for these people who were her friends prior to suddenly then get you know their nose put out of shape because what she gets she becomes successful earns big bucks playing on a big stage and then they start airing out all her dirty laundry i'm not really for that i think that's really scummy behavior if you were a cool with her prior and now you're not called cool anymore because she doesn't return your text to get on a flipping burger and guest list then so what stick it up your ass and man up in it there's no need to kind of air out all her stuff and now make it seem like she's a pseudo disc jockey you're okay trying to teach her how to make songs and because she didn't you know follow your advice or 
follow through with anything or maybe stick to what you wanted to do now she's a problem like come on miss me with that shit it continues she also criticized nina kravitz but after a while at the moment of her glory she hypercritically began to upload selfies with nina she also asked my advice about whether it was worth her to do to make friends with matt edwards so that he could help her in her career to which i answered you shouldn't mess with that devil um, again i don't know why this is necessary information i can tell many stories about these famous fake djs like nastia oh my god and others he's throwing nastia in under the we're gonna get we're gonna get an entire essay from nastia now she's gonna write a book because she's always sharing her feelings and letting us know um what she thinks about her djing and the scene in general oh my god this is gonna be an absolute dr this drama is not gonna end for a while um nash and others it continues so as i was closely acquainted with them or rather it was the times when they were kissed my hands and when they were unknown these people do not need music but they use music as a tool for their own glory and enrichment hey d thanks for your courage so again if you're daniel wang man you must be feeling a little bit yucky that he's the one co-signing you but no it says here whoa thanks for this dot 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 from daniel wang so he's clearly just trying to bury her under any sort of you know under any circumstances which is very odd because you remember he was the guy that was like oh i'm 20 years deep in the industry i don't need her cloud i need her thing so why are you going this hard at somebody especially when you read through back of the story it's like what they had a bit of a tiff she was a bad neighbor they didn't get on they fell out that's it like they're not taking like you know the people that would go and see daniel ang play probably don't know who peggy goo is or vice versa so i don't really see the issue here of, of course there's you know this thing a whole about you know she may be a bit two-faced and was talking ill about nina and then suddenly she gets a bit of fame and she's nina's friend i don't know i don't what can you say about stuff like that it is what it is the game is the game in it um she gets a bit of success and then suddenly the people that she was kind of sniping at become her friends it's cool um there's not many you know high profile successful female djs out there at the moment anyway in general lack of representation of course so it will make sense that she would go out of her way to be friends or befriend somebody of that status it would be, probably serve her best interest in it anyway that aside um peggy Goo finally replied to everything that was going on and she uploaded a it looks like a igtv <laughs> video and um it's a bit odd I'm not, I'm not gonna lie again i'm not no big fan of her myself you know i love a couple of her productions but in general you know she's essentially you know she's always kind of um felt like a bit of an influencer turned dj for me which doesn't really matter but again there's a lot of people out there I want to listen to, so I'd rather listen to them. But if you had to ask me, gun to head, would you go and see her play somewhere? Probably not. But if if I did see her play somewhere, would I run away? Probably not. But again, you know, I don't really think about her too much in that regard. But her reply did make me think, you know what? She might have an issue recovering from this just because I would assume part of her appeal is that she's just like this international girl pretty girl that wears cool clothes right you can see all the bright colors and patterns and all these kind of influencer pictures and all this sort of jazz like that right like part of her appeal is her kind of likability or quasi likability because you know you don't you never really know people so without that like how can you kind of carry on this kind of fun loving party girl image when people know behind the scenes that you're yelling at your assistant to get your Louis Vuitton bag up the stairs and shit it's a bit difficult isn't it but anyway let's hear what she has to say regarding the whole incident um the caption reads whoops the caption reads my statement um thanks to everyone who has shown love and support um the rest who believe in false rumors you can get the fuck out of here I got shit to do so of course let's get this in full screen let's lower the volume a tad and let's see what she has to say hi guys for those who ask about the post yes i've seen it it surprised me he feels such a hate because we used to be friends a long time ago she's got a weird accent in it like she's got that sort of like international school accent i think it's kind of like the equivalent of like you know when you like put loads of you put the, all the colors of paint into one bowl and you mix it and it just turns out brown and it's not even a good brown it's just like a brown doesn't make any sense that's what intentional accents sound like like because you're just surrounded by so many different folk and you i don't know you're in a high school in the mountains of switzerland somewhere and you've been taught english by a native italian speaker who lived in chicago you develop this like weird accent that you can't really point it sounds asian then it sounds like you know it sounds kind of asian then it sounds like a pacific place in asia then it sounds quite european then it sounds like a specific place in Europe. 
then it has the grammatical structure of something Scandinavian. It's just all over the place, isn't it? Like, don't you think so? Maybe it's just me. I don't know. He could have called me. He used to be a lovely neighbor, <laughs> but I hope you can see now why I had to move house six months ago. <laughs> yeah, he does. Imagine. He was preparing. Daniel Wang was preparing like um, Google Docs on her, innit? Collecting evidence and then hoping one day to kind of put it out there and shame her for her desire to put up a what shelf with 600 shoes i don't know there's also so many things i could also say about this made-up story what it did to me but we'll be here all day and i don't want to waste my energy on it but i will say is that our relationship changed ever since i defended myself i didn't think it was a major disagreement but he did ne mm. I guess you can't explain away everything, but I guess part of the issue I think I feel with this apology is that most of the issues aren't really to do with what Daniel Wang said, because we all know they're frivolous, right? Arguing about Eames chairs and Louis Vuitton bags and Ikea furniture and conduct in the airport and first class seats. It's just ridiculous. We don't care. All DJs are divas. She's a diva. It is what it is. The issue more so has to be for her, public image wise, PR wise, are the stories in the comments below right with people who've kind of interacted with her people that have seen her out and about in the scene you know whatever it may be who have kind of shared some pretty you know bad scathing reports of how she conducts herself and again if you're this happy-go-lucky fun-loving person it's quite difficult to kind of continue with that facade and everyone's seen the what the what what lies behind the mask but again what do i know next time i saw him he was hostile towards me Sure, I can be difficult sometimes. <laughs> I never said I'm perfect, but I'm not. I never said I'm perfect. It's always the it's like a, it's like a little it's like a semi gaslighting term in it, right? I'm not perfect. <laughs> the type of person has been described, and I will never regret standing up for myself. It is disappointing to see someone focusing their energy on childish vendettas and false rumors, but I can't stop that. Especially when there's so much more going on in the world right now. <laughs> like what? Collecting <laughs> plastic on a beach for Instagram. <laughs> I don't know, man. This woman's a fucking legend. She's an absolute legend. She's a one man. Like the amount of the amount of piss that she boils is just insane, isn't it? This little Asian lady, right, has really got under people's skin and it's really funny from the outside looking at i don't understand it now don't get me wrong i get it from a purist point of view right her journey like i said before previously into djing has been somewhat padded and maybe exalted and fast-tracked whatever right it happens it is what it is some people get anointed and get chosen in whatever entertainment circles to be posted up and it you know it is what it is but there's plenty of DJs to choose from, plenty of other people you can go and follow, producers, artists, whatever it may be. Um, you can kind of, you know, put your attention towards and boost them up and signal boost their whatever they're doing. But for some people, especially the, the especially the people that are actually working in the industry, people who you would assume to be very successful, they seem to be really bothered by her. That's the really interesting thing that I don't really know what it's about. Because I'd assume Daniel Wang isn't the only person I'm assuming there's other people who are of his stature in the scene especially in Berlin because you know people love to gossip about dance music and people working within it behind the scenes in Berlin I'm assuming there's a lot of other people of his same level of his stature who have a big problem with how she acts and how she goes about doing what she's doing and again considering the amount of DJs you know you could probably you know you could throw a CD and hit some and hit a DJ on the street somewhere, right? Everyone plays flipping music over there to some varying degrees. It's really interesting to, to I really want to know why she seems to be the one that really ticks people over the wrong way. Is she just a representation of what everything they hate? Is she just the final straw that broke the camel's back? Or is she really this flipping um what is she? What did Danny Wang say? Is she really Trump in disguise, right? Is she basically the Asian Ivanka Trump? I don't know. I really want to know. But I do think it's important to consider this type of weak shit post about women making music is enabling sexist behavior and more. You should never let anyone bring you down. I wish him and the haters all the best. I have nothing more to say. I do feel guilty about one thing, though. Having too many shoes, apparently. But hey, good piggy shoe after all. 
that didn't really make any most. I didn't know what that was about. That was funny, but it didn't really make no sense. I don't know. People call it a Peggy Shoe. That's a bit weird, isn't it? A bit weird of a nickname. Um, I, I said before to somebody, I think that would have been, it would have been really funny if she just would have not made this video and just replied or not made the video, just kind of ignored it, and then posted the cover of her new EP. And on the cover, she's just sitting let's say maybe either stark naked or not or clothed but sitting on an eames chair like that kind of you know what's it that one with the legs bit and the, you know, the, the chair like that would be sick she just post, uploads a picture with a new ep cover and it's just her sitting on an eames chair that would be so epic it'd be the epic it'd be the best troll i don't really think she needed to reply in video form or in any way shape or form in the direct way because in general the accounts that were people were putting out there about her felt pretty honest again maybe some of it was tinged there was a tinge of misogynistic um you know vitriol included in it but for the most part a lot of people had personal experiences with her and they were agreed by it and they wanted to air it out now do i think the danny wang thing was a bit of uh uh, was a was a bit was a pile of nonsense probably yeah but a lot of the accounts especially if you go through some of the reports on the con on the comments should make her concerned I reckon but I think she'll be okay I don't think people are gonna really care I think if you're a fan of hers you're not gonna be influenced by what Danny Wang has to say you're still gonna follow what she does you're still gonna go see her play at flipping I don't know X or Y or whatever where she plays and stuff and you're not really gonna care about all this nonsense but I think the comments on her post is definitely going to be concerning you know people seem to really have a big problem with her says he agreed i have a, some random person here Nathan says he's agreed i have a few stories from paradise van in dc 10 about her she's known as a group that tries to get that girl into order to dj it says in fire festival was a dj thanks for coming to speak jesus christ if fire festival was a dj they called her it says all you djs are missing out on a fantastic opportunity to promote your mixes here if someone posted their mix i'm not ever clicking that it's on Beeport as well. You can get sodded. It continues here. Another person, I'm just wondering, what is it that she actually did wrong now, except for being an arrogant star woman, kind of torn as a fan of both now. I guess I'll stick to my love for music. Yeah, you should never really idolize DJs anyway in general. Innit? You should just listen to what they put out and keep it moving. But hey, that's probably just me. Um, what else here? I see another high rated comment who also said something. Got one here. He said, I can, I can feel you, dear Daniel. We from uh, the obviously the was that the techno, the worst techno memes page. He said, I've been watching for the years how she terrorizes the rest of the world. <laughs> this must be a huge disaster for the scene. Responsibility on those who make them famous. That's it. That sounds a little bit, a little bit trolly. I'm not sure if they're being serious there. Another 122 likes, she says here, or this person says, techno wankers, tracks dealers goes producer users and unable ones to mix rappers charter flight djs these are the bitter realities of the electronic music scene somewhat agree but it is what it is you've got for coolers um cover of course there um got another comment here from another person 20 likes that says then one day quoting what she said what he said then one day the old man from the seventh floor who loves rolling stones came in a rage and said daniel are you a friend and he she says um i was eagerly hoping to be brought back to the old man from the seventh floor and his love for the rolling stones <laughs> daniel wang includes a comment here uh i don't want to read what yes says there's no point what else is another good comment You've got one that says here, everyone should be respected as an individual, but no one should be idolized. There's a quote <laughs> picture here with Albert Einstein, it looks like in Biggie Good. I don't know what that's about. Respect was invented to cover the empty place where love should be. Uh, quote by from Leo Tolstoy, <laughs> which is odd. You've got another one here. Well, this is what you don't want to know about electronic music industry. Death cases of coronavirus increased extremely after playgraves over Europe, France, especially while groups of DJs were like so. Dave Clark were uh, warning people to hold off on participation in organizing raves. Another group of DJs and promoters simply didn't give a fuck and the dollars were rolling in. The responsibility must be investigated properly. Yeah, I guess, but people don't really give a shit. Um, another comment here i know who how much it costs you to write write, uh, write and something like this daniel thank you for doing so okay that's a bit of a uh what you call it slurpy comment there but whatever might be a friend hey danny thank you for that i also remember very well our conversation in january when we last saw each other in dusseldorf i hope you feel better now and you can sleep again bruv Peg, little Peggy Goo is keeping grown men up in their sleep like you have to question yourself in that regard bruv you need to relax another one 
you got a person called Danny Olive, someone, someone called Danny Oliveira says it's the vomit. I keep telling people vomit everywhere on the booth, on the decks, on the dance floor, just vomit all over the place. Don't know about that one. Yeah, man, I don't know. If I'm, if I'm our, her ex tour manager confirms a nightmare, who's this? What does this person say? This is the issue that I'd have if you're Peggy in it. These random people are coming out and just essentially calling you out of your name on a consistent basis. What's the, what's the pin cause of trouble? What, what do they say? Can you see this? I don't know what it says, something. Oh, there you go. To read, Florian, finally someone is telling the truth. Myself, the victim for nearly one year of being her tour manager, it took me one year to recover. Ugh, mate, you have to give your head a rubble or whoever, mate or sister. You know, it's not that serious, really. But hey, maybe that's just me. Um, let's go back. We don't want to see anything more from this person, do we? We don't really care. But hey, people are angry people are frustrated um then the last one here we've got a person that says i have my own ongoing horror story with a similar artist i can assure you is 50 times worse if you find a support group for people working in the music scene that should have to deal with awful djs please let me know so yeah everyone's freaking out everyone's going crazy i don't think it's that big of a deal but again um i just think we're just in this weird time where everyone's sort of at home not playing places and you know just trying to tear down each other in an effort to maybe fill that empty void of DJing usually fills that's my assumption anyway regardless but let me know what you think man what do you think of Peggy Good's reply did you think she needed to reply in that manner do you think it's going to affect her ability to tour I don't think so personally but I'll let you know your thoughts and opinions behind that do you think some of the detail some of the stories surrounding her are over exaggerated or do you think they are bang on should people be telling these stories um i think people have a responsibility to maybe you know safeguard some of the women the you know especially we don't have that many especially at the highest level playing should we try our best to make sure they're protected let me know in the comments down below moving on what else do we have here moving on moving on deep what else do we talk about here i'm not gonna talk about uh, talk about this talk about this talk about oh yeah we've got this this is a fun one so this is an old clip this is from last year but somebody uploaded it again recently um in the fire and the kids subreddit so big up the homeless cats over there um this is an interview with tim dylan and brendan shaw on his obviously very widely popular tim dylan show podcast i really recommend you check it out tim dylan's definitely one of my favorite comedians out at the moment uh an absolute fire breather of a comedian if you're a fan of bill burr and that sort of style of comedy definitely check out tim dylan um he sat down with with brendan shaw but had a bit of an interview and towards the end they sort of like spoke about i don't know why it was at the end but he essentially kind of quizzed him on his kind of upbringing or his sort of start in comedy and you know how he essentially got to position that he's in now and it kind of got me thinking about maybe about the reason why some people hate brendan shaw to the level that they hate him because i've been kind of observing the fire and the kids subreddit from a distance for a while especially during lockdown and you know of course during lockdown you know the fire and the kid have gone through a bit of a stressful time um you know brian cannon's essentially been cancelled allegations of rape uh brendan shaw was you know accused of sliding into girls dm early in the year but he sort of like skated around that expertly and he's just been generally been you know taking the piss out of in general by in people People in the comedy space because i don't think it's funny and because i think it's a bit of an oath um but the hate has been really consistent with brendan shaw throughout the entire lockdown right of course most of it has been his own fault he says some really dumb stuff about covid and lockdowns and comedy and you know just generally how he's just approached things of course the scandal with chris D'Elia, people weren't really a fan of how he sort of reacted to that the crying on camera not calling his friend directly you know blah de, blah 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 the deleting the brand had his name on the bio of the fire and the kid because they sold the rights to whatever that cast media group is whatever it is that control it loads of things that you could have a reason to really not dislike the guy to dislike the guy i guess but some of the consistent levels of kind of dislike and hatred towards him have been have haven't really dipped in any way shape or form it's been a consistent kind of uprising and you know there'll be a moment where it'll kind of level up but it just keeps going up and up and up and up and i think a lot of it has to do with just the fact that of how he made it in comedy i just think there are 
it's I don't know why it is, but it seems like stand up comedy fans or fans of that whole stand up comedy podcast scene are really tied toward are really tied or attached to comedians sort of like origin story and the group they're kind of coming up from and you know funny stories about them told in third person on other shows whatever it may be but they're really tied into it right and they're really keen fans of stand-up too so when they hear a story of brendan Schaub essentially skipping steps to get what he's got to um of course his relationship with joe rogan has basically played a huge role in terms of allowing him to reach the audience he's maybe reached and of course his own hard work bloody blah, blah 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 they definitely just they kind of i guess it feels like they take it personally that he's gotten as far as he has gotten to when some of their other faves in the scene are you know languishing in you know open mics and dingy restaurants somewhere where no one's basically watching so i guess I, that's where i kind of think it coming from and again this is a clip um where he kind of details his kind of come up in the scene and i'm going to comment on it on the other side so this is from the tim dylan show episode number 174 <clears throat> uh like six seven years ago and were you were doing stand-up then or you just met him before? no met him and then uh started doing the fire and the kid <sighs> then took that on the road and that's when i started doing stand-up so fire and the kid's been around for six years six years and then you guys developed a huge fan base right out the gate and then took that on the road when did you meet rogan met rogan mm -hmm. i mean well remember rogan was a ufc okay. commentator of course so okay. when i was fighting the ufc me and rogan were boys okay and then we got really close when i moved to la right and then him and brian were the ones who were like do stand when did up. you first do stand up? I uh, first did stand, and again, it does feel like a bit of a grilling. It does feel like Tim Dillon's being a little bit patronizing, but you know, the questions need to be asked. And uh, would be, yeah, I mean, first time we did a live fire in the kid because uh, we did it at Bray Improv, 550 people. That was my open mic, and Brian was like, Oh, you're gonna go out and you do 10 minutes stand up. You can wow. go and do 10 minutes. He was like, so every show we're going to start doing this. This can be your open mic. And how, did, how, was the, how did the first one go? Not great. Right. Not great. I mean, not, you know. It's, right. That, but, that, but that's the thing where people are like, oh, you didn't have to do the open mic thing where no one's around. I'm like, well, hold on. You mean open mics where it's full of other comics hating on the, the comics who are performing? Right. My open mic was in front of 550 people, tons of pressure. Yeah. That's where the problem is, right? Because it wasn't really tons of pressure because you're performing. It, it was pressure to some extent because pressure is pressure, but it wasn't the same sort of pressure as going in a open mic in a bar where no one knows who you are, doesn't really appreciate your presence, didn't know there was going to be comedy on a night and then having to convince them to listen to you and also convince them that you're funny and entertaining. That's a completely different skill. And of course, it allows you to probably develop as a comedian in a far more, I wouldn't say organic way, but in a far more world rounded way right of course he's performing in front of people right people's people but when you're performing in front of podcast fans who are just you know who kind of hang on your every word who know all your little um idiosyncrasies and your little ticks and stuff that are humorous to them you, there's no real failing you could do poorly of course you know public speaking in any regard in any way shape or form is difficult and um, even if you're talking to a brick wall it's hard to kind of keep a conversation flowing and make it entertaining and have structure to it and all that sort of good stuff but there's no denying there is a complete night and day between an actual comic going through the tried and tested route of becoming good at stand-up and what he basically done now the only the only sort of uh the only sort of uh you know thing that i'd kind of give him on this is that i think going forward what will end up happening in my opinion which is you see happening a lot now with the younger comedians especially with the whole advent of podcasting and the fact that you can build and cultivate a fan base um via youtube via podcast via social media platforms pretty quickly and to a very sort of like um to a grand scale if you want to i think we're going to see a lot more brendan shorbs coming up in the scene people who sort of cultivate a fan base decide to pivot into stand-up comedy and then take the and then kind of if straight away have a big fan base you see it a lot with these sort of like um tiktok comedians right like i can't think of their name of this person but there's one girl who's always talking about being latina right i forgot her name people would take the piss if she's talking about being latina that kind of comedy isn't really something that you see outside of social media anyway is a certain type of comedy but if she decides to start doing straight stand-up she's gonna have you know however many millions of people have follow on social media as her captive audience straight off the bat and they're gonna be 
very receptive to whatever material that she puts out there because they're fans of her as a person. So I think stand-up comedians and fans of comedy will have to kind of grapple with this new breed of comedian entering the space who isn't quite you know what they were expecting or used to in previous years but they're kind of doing it in a different sort of they, or they're not, well, not what they're used to and they're also doing it in a different way now it doesn't mean it's a bad way they're doing it it just means they're not going to be maybe as polished as a person that you're used to because they've spent five six years not being famous going touring the country you know in bumfuck places and doing shows in front of nobody honing their craft and then by the time they become famous enough for you to notice them they've perfected their skill now of course with a person like brendan Shaw, he's sort of learning in public so it's hard to sort of um it's hard to sort of have a fair opinion on his level of stand-up there is obviously an idea i thinking i've read somewhere online where people say it's difficult for people i've heard someone say that it's very difficult for somebody over the age of let's say 28 or something who wasn't funny who wasn't like you know on stage doing stuff to just get funny straight away it's just a hard thing to learn as a skill um especially when they kind of skip the steps when you haven't gone to do open mics all this sort of stuff and into competitions and uh what they called showcases and all this sort of stuff you've just gone immediately in front of your um audience base and then he had the other error again which i think what he'd done which probably didn't help his career well which didn't help his perception with fans i think his career is completely fine right he drives a porsche and lives in a mansion he's doing pretty well what didn't help his how he's perceived was the fact that he decided to take that showtime special that was kind of given to him what three four years in his stand-up journey he probably should have probably waited a long time a longer time to do it but i understand you know when you get given the opportunity to do a special with showtime and i'm assuming the whole below the belt stuff was probably tied in with that um an idea that he'd become like a showtime you know personality and all this sort of stuff it's just too good to turn down and then i think any rational person anyone would a, you know with a bit of a common sense would probably take the deal too even if you're not ready hoping that you just can turn up on the day and really show out so he explains a bit of it now that's huge yeah now and then your first special was showtime how many years after that three do you feel like when three you look back do you say um that was a crazy fast crazy crazy fast. insane 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 to do a special that insane that, yeah, yeah, yeah nuts yeah it's nuts. wild wild would you do another one tomorrow no yeah no, I'd probably wait, probably wait two years. I might do, I might do something, but not a not a not a f hour special. When you look back at the special, how do you feel about it now? Um, I feel I everyone feel, hates everything they do. I hate every. Right? I hate, I hate, I I hate all my podcasts. I hate. I hate, I hate my, my set I'm gonna do tonight. Minute, I, I hate I the set like I'm gonna do tonight. Yeah, I hate, hate everything. everything. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm proud of it. I'm proud of what I accomplished. Short amount of time. Yeah. I think it's I'm the, crazy. I think I'm the time. fastest person to get a like a big network special yeah. in under a certain amount of years. Right. Which is a blessing and a curse. Um, but yeah, I'm proud of it. You know, for sure. Yeah. But it's. And again, that's why I think where he loses people. I think. The beginning bit is where it's a branding that we probably should see more to probably win a, over more of the detractors, let's say. But he does have this sort of chip on his shoulder and this sort of like false sense of confidence because of the success of the podcast, because he sells out shows in places where he can. I think Joey Diaz spoke about it a few times where Joey Diaz said something along the lines of his, some of his older shows, I think back on the church, he used to say something like, oh, it's really dangerous for an up and coming comedian to hang out with too many successful comedians because you're both doing the same thing. You stand on the stage holding a microphone, telling jokes. You somehow get this false sense of security. Or you get this false sense of idea or status, yeah, or position that you're similar. You're the same. Like, because if you, cause you speak to Bill Burr at the comedy store car park, you somehow think that you're the same person you're the same level when you're not right he's obviously far 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 ahead of what you're doing in talent in experience whatever it may be so it's quite advantageous just to kind of stick with the people who are at the same experience level as you we've got their training rules on two years in five years in doing shitty shows in and around that's who you should be spending your time with day in day out to hone your craft and to kind of keep the fire burning in that regard kind of hanging out with all the hollywood types kind of diminishes um your idea of how you look at yourself and your craft and i think that's what's happened to Brent because obviously he's close friends with Joe and you know being friends with Joe automatically gets you in with everybody else in the comedy store because they want to be nice to you because you're Joe Rogan's friend all that sort of stuff so that doesn't help and then of course him not 
wanting to say out loud that he's thinks his first special was crap which it was admittedly i think you know all the reviews could basically get, get attest to it which is it's not fair to ascribe of reviews because reviews can be a bit um skewed you look at you know the reviews that dave chappelle special get uh you know and kind of compare the audience reviews to the critics reviews not one thing but in general the audience reviews of brennan Shaw's special you'd be surprised are really bad right and it wasn't a good special there weren't many you know jokes in there mostly stories just told on the podcast tried to speak in a humorous manner manner that really weren't that great um and it just seemed rushed it seemed like he wasn't ready for it it wasn't a, it wasn't a memorable thing he never really speaks about it himself so he, i think he knows deep down that it wasn't good so it's hard to admit it in front of a peer that he did a bad job i understand it but it will probably be serve him better for his image and for his likability if that is even important if he cares about that to basically admit his sort of faults and where he sort of falls short and basically be like hey i'm just learning i'm just learning out loud it's not the conventional way to do it but hopefully i want to get a level where i'm of the same standard of people i look up to xyz and me but i think because it feels like he's sort of gaming the system people tend to kind of not like him as a person that's probably what i, I kind of gleaned from this again this is just my interpretation from what i saw in this small clip of this interview but i'd love to know your thoughts man because a lot of people that aren't really big fans of brendan and go out their way to make his life a living hell but i'd love to know what you think about the situation what do you think do you think do you do you um do you think he rushed his career do you think there's anything he could do to kind of win you over if you are a uh brendan shaw hater as he basically says hater right um i'd love to look i'd love to hear your thoughts regarding it let me know in the comments down below is there anything he could do to possibly win you over um and for the ones that think he's funny do you think the hate that he gets is undeserved let me know as well in the comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts regarding that too. Next on the list, I think we're going to end on this one because I've been talking for way too long. Way too long. Okay, cool. So we've got an interesting video here, a video that I didn't think I'd um, play, especially considering the subject matter, um, you know, spoken about. So obviously, you know, I've covered um, the whole cancellation of Chris Lear and Brian, Brian Callen within the LA comedy scene. You know, they've both been accused of varying levels of debauchery. I guess in Chris Lear's case, he's probably less severe charges of maybe, you know, um, creeping into DMs of, you know, girls who seemed like they were underage, but weren't and some that were bloody blah, 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 back and forth, who knows. And also, you know, having a partner at home with a newborn baby probably wasn't a good look. So, and of course, when you uh, take into account his image of being like a happy go lucky, funny dude, it didn't really marry up well that you were kind of, you know, this guy behind closed doors or away from the glaring lights whilst he was on tour was sliding into various teenagers dms but hey it's a cold dark world people get lonely and they want a bit of comfort and i guess it is what it is each to their own but for the most part most of his la comedian friends have kind of abandoned him some rightly or wrongly some of his closer friends like whitney cumming brian callen brendan shaw joe rogan some of these kind of you know other stand-up la comedy store people have kind of gone out of their way to not mention him and kind of pretend that he never existed of course Bert crash i mentioned previously it's been alleged that he quite possibly had deleted or reshot an episode of the cabin that featured chris lear in it and everyone's kind of gone their way to distance him which has been really interesting to observe from the outside in and kind of shocking considering how um popular he was with some of these people in the podcasting space right he contributed to many and many of thousands and if not millions of views to their podcast allowed them to reach a bigger audience um you know was a great podcast um, guest created viral clips that are still um resonate with fans you know that live in that podcasting community and just was generally kind of for me that's i didn't look like a bit of a good friend to these people but when he kind of you know um was in a bit of trouble and of course he was being cancelled some say rightly some say wrongly it felt like they all sort of like went out of their way to abandon him and distance themselves from him you know self-preservation and all that malarkey and um some of the people that came out and fought his corner have been surprising though and this is another one um trisha paytas um recently on the recent episodes of frenemies a podcast she does with heath and klein of um h3h3 she sits down and essentially grills Ethan, I guess, towards the end of the podcast because I guess he's in a bad mood and kind of asks him why. And they somehow get to speaking about Chris D'Elia. Really, really strange. You would never assume Chris, Chris, Trisha Paytas even knew who Chris D'Elia was, let alone when to speak about him to Ethan Klein. But she basically brought up the idea that, hey, he was your friend. Have you spoken to him? What's going on? I'd love to speak to him. But let's, let's hear what Trisha Paytas has to say about the issue. 
you love this still. You still love it? You still love doing the H3 podcast? I do. I like it a lot. I like it more than I ever did. Okay. I... My thoughts on the one today is you look just over it. Like you don't want to be alone on it. Like you were alone on the podcast day interviewing somebody and you just were like, hey guys, welcome back to the H3 podcast. You're talking about just... ContraPoints? The last one? Yeah, the one today, yeah. People thought it was really good. People you, thought it was okay, great. maybe, but you looked miserable. Well, I will out. say, first of all, I disagree. I thought that was a great interview, and I really like her. I think she's awesome. That being said, I do have hard time with interviews. I find them to be very challenging. So I pr much prefer the collaborative ones, like with you and with the guys. That, to me, is more fun and less stressful. Anything else? Next. <laughs> I love interviews. Like, I think I thrive at interviews. I wish I could have, maybe I could host the H3 podcast. Imagine listening to this person speak on an everyday basis on YouTube. I know she's very popular and people seem to like her, but I just, I, YouTube is, you know, the courses for courses. Everyone's got their person that they like and stuff. And there's someone for everybody out there, but God almighty, man, what an interesting voice. It's like she's speaking on fast forward. You know, you have that little feature on your YouTube where you can sort of like uh, speed up. Is it, what's it called? It's, it's on here, right? Uh, the, the Playback speed. That's it. She's got a playback speed on times two. Um, but she's also very oddly clear in what she says. So it's really quick, but it's really clear. It's really interesting. Cast by myself. God, I mean, sure. Who do you want to interview? Um, Chris Leah. Done. <laughs> Where is he? In hiding. Really? Use that Twitter I mean, connect. I, I have him. You know him. I have his phone number, but I feel bad messaging. I don't know. He's on his own thing. He's 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 in a he's having a hard time for sure. What do you do? Here's a good question. Okay, what do you do when? Okay, like literally, like okay, we'll use Ela. She's unproblematic. Don't get mad at me, Ela. But like, what if she got in like this crazy scandal, right? Like if she she was at a party just saying the N word, N word, no COVID mask, like all this. You know what I mean? I know it's not gonna happen, but like she messes up big time, right? Or Crystalia, for instance. Okay, let's say she was flirting with seventeen year old Ela or something. You know what I mean? Jesus. <laughs> okay. I mean, he's you. What if you're flirting with a 17 year old? Why? That's three examples so far. Just to get one point across, this girl is absolutely insane. I mean, okay. Dan, what if yeah, you're flirting Dan with a 17 year old? Flirting with 17 year old. Okay. <laughs> I, but, okay, you love this person, right? Like, when someone gets in so much deep shit, how do you do you defend them? Do you not defend them? Do you have to denounce them? Look, like, you don't. I think if it was someone that was very close to me, let's say like my best friend got into, was caught like uh, flirting with a 17 year old or something. Right. Or fucking, or fucking a 17 year old. Like Chris Lee was just what talking a parent, allegedly. Well, he was, he was, he was, he was fucking him. really young fans. Okay. Of age. Right. You would, you know, I would definitely denounce the behavior. First issue. Can we have a grown up conversation about, um, you know, especially men of influence and, you know, status and their preference for younger girls. Isn't that just a thing in general in Hollywood? Aren't most, you know, production company executives, big Hollywood stars, TV stars, music stars for the most part with women that are far younger than them to a certain degree, maybe not in their teens, but definitely, you know, more than five, 10 years younger than them. That's just a thing that happens. Now, is it gross? Is it weird? Is it odd? Yes. But is it illegal? No. If they're of age, it doesn't, doesn't really matter to that extent. I guess that's where Chris really fucked up in that regard because there's that one episode or one scenario of person where I think he hit up a girl that was allegedly 17. She said she's underage. He said, oh, my bad, stepped away. And then as soon as she turned 18, he kind of slipped back into the DMs. Now, I think that story is the one that he argues that she purposely deleted the messages and made it look like he hit by her back. He hit her back up. But the actual thing, if you look at it, is that what he alleges or his camp alleges is that that girl that was 17 then hit him up when she turned 18 and said, hey, I'm re I'm, da I'm DTF basically. And then they really kind of kind of connected. Now, should he be an adult in a situation and maybe be a little bit more mature and a bit more careful who he talks to? Probably, yeah. But when you're horny, you're horny, I'm assuming, isn't it? Especially when you've got access and you've got money and time and stuff. You just want to get what you want to get. Um, so that's odd that you have to denounce people for being attracted to young girls. Like, I don't, or younger girls or younger women. It's a bit odd that you have to denounce that really. Um, I don't know. But as a friend, you see a lot of redeeming qualities and you want them to get better and you want them to be well. So like, obviously that's, that's the, the nature of it, right? It's like you denounce the behavior, but you encourage the person to grow and be better and you stand by them. Right. 
he didn't do much of that to be honest when it comes to Crystal Lear, but I don't blame him too because I don't think Ethan is again it's hard for Ethan to answer this question because he's not one of Crystal Lear's closest friends. They obviously built up a bit of a relationship and a friendship over time. He was you know, he had a couple of good appearances on the H three podcast. Um they seem to have a bit of a connection, the three of them. Um um Ethan and Hila. When I used to watch, I don't really watch their podcasts anymore, but at the time, you know, you saw a little bit of kinship developing there, especially you know, considering they're all LA based uh, entertainers and content creators. So it's hard for him to be put in that position. I think if anyone who should be grilled on this, it's the Whitney Cummins, it's the Brian Callens, the Brendan Shorbs, the Joe Rogans, the, I don't know, whoever else is in the LA comedy scene, they should be grilled more. The Bobby Lees, right? They should be probably held more to account for like essentially abandoning their friend at their moment of need. Who cares about what he done really? Let's let's be honest. If that's your friend, really, like day to day, like let's just be honest. Wouldn't you go out of your way, especially if you know they haven't done anything really gross and like like legitimately gone after you know prepubescent teenagers and stuff in a really pedophilic way? They're just attracted to younger girls and they're a bit reckless, especially if they got a partner at home who you know. You'd admonish them, right? You'd pull them to the side and say, "Hey, that's not cool." You tell them off, but you'd be there for your friend, wouldn't you? I'd assume you would. But I guess if you're in Hollywood, you've got your agents and you've got your managers on breathing down your neck and stuff, it changes it. But I think it's a bit unfair for Ethan to be put in this position because, again, I don't think he's a close, close friend, but it's interesting, his perspective. So interesting. I would stand by my friend. Because so many people denounced Crystalia. Well, yeah. Brian Callen, Whitney Cummings, like people that were like that, hardcore. That to me is like, that's, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm friendly with Chris, but if I was really close with Chris, I don't think, if I was like, you know, that level of closeness, I would probably, what I would say is, um, you know. But it's hard too, because if it doesn't really strike me as the most, uh, uh, principled, friendly guy. Cause th th didn't he throw PewDiePie under the bus when he got involved in that N word gate saga when he inadvertently accidentally <laughs> slipped out the N word in frustration when he was playing a game? He denounced him pretty quickly, even though they were friends, innit? That was really odd. So it's hard to ask him because these people are like, they're, they're very concerned about their career admittedly so which they should be i don't think it's bad i think people on the outside need to be a little bit forgiving right to be a successful content creator of any sort of notoriety requires years and years and hours and hours of dedicated work and it's still not guaranteed that you're going to be successful so to finally get there the last thing you want is to be cancelled or for your career to get taken away from you from the actions of somebody that you don't even know or you know loosely or the actions of somebody else and not yourself you don't want that in any way shape or form so there's going to be a little bit of a um there's going to be a little bit of a risk aversion to kind of getting your your career cancelled which makes sense especially if you've got a family or even if you're on your own it doesn't matter you just don't want to lose the status that you've kind of built up for yourself over a period of time so i definitely get it but it's hard to ask him because again like i said i don't think he's the most uh principled man when it comes to these sort of things Obviously, we did. We talked about it a lot. I mean, what he did was was really gross. But as a person, you know, as a per, I said, as, as a person, Chris was lovely. He was one a super nice dude, right? Super sweet. You know, when Theodore was born, he sent us like a really thoughtful baby gift that not a lot of people did that were that thoughtful. But he just abandoned his podcast, like just left. Like, like what happened? Like, you well, know? Matt, dude, he was in like a huge blockbuster film and they like fucking cut his ass out. Like he's uh. just probably in a really shitty spot. Like, I think it's that's the most and like he's thing. engaged and he's having a baby at the same time. So right. a lot. No, I like my stance always is like older guys with younger girls. I think you're like the scum of the earth because that's how I got so fucked up. I think it's like the grossest thing you could do. Mm. But at the same time, it's like, wow, like it's crazy how f people just turn. And I saw that with people in my own life too that had like scandal, like how many people just like unfollowing him, like you're disgusting. Meanwhile- Well, there's they a difference between like, um, you know, Trisha made an insensitive TikTok and like here's uh, here's evidence of, <laughs> of behavior over years of him taking advantage of young girls. I wanna interview Crystal, yeah. Okay. I think it might have been an actually interesting one because she is like the most uncancelable YouTube personality that exists, right? Whatever scandal, you know, 
self-inflicted or mistakenly that she gets herself involved in she always seems to recover um probably it's different when you're youtube famous i think you can just ride it out i think there's a lot of deplorable questionable human beings that exist on facebook who probably don't come across as the best of people but they seem to survive because their fan base just are in love with them so that probably does help but it's harder when you're a comedian it's harder when you're a public figure it's hard well, it's harder when you're a comedian working within the hollywood um entertainment infrastructure um you know he was obviously making efforts to be a hollywood star he was obviously going to be in this action movie that tig notaro has replaced him in he's trying to work in that industry and you know the me too thing da -da 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 -da. there's just so many elements at play that are going to sort of um, that are basically in charge of dictating whether or not you're a success or not or whether or not you're allowed to have a career um, that it's very difficult to sort of bounce back from these big scandals now I've always said I think another issue that he was that he Chris had is that he had this kind of you know squeaky clean image so to suddenly be accused of that crazy shit really didn't help him I think if you're Louis CK you can kind of bounce back a bit easier because you're known you know you tell us in your stand-up you know you tell us in interviews that you're a creep that you're a bit of a sexual deviant you know that you've got these dark thoughts so we are used to hearing these kind of questionable crazy things about your psyche and about your actions in general so when you hear a story about you so allegedly you know whacking off into a plant pot it's not that big of a disconnect from who you present yourself to be but then the crystal lee side he has such bad timing in that he was you know portraying a um pedophile on the show you then he gets accused of doing the same thing he's portrayed about and then a slew of girls come out who are all younger looking but of course mostly legal it just doesn't look good optics wise isn't it and the fact that none of his friends came up and stood up for him as well doesn't help because you'd imagine in some of these cases it does help when some of your friends hey say hey he's my friend i'm gonna stand by him none of them did so that made other people think hey maybe he is a bad guy because no one's kind of coming to bat for him but i don't know judging from what i've seen online people seem to like him i just think people just didn't want to touch him because it's a radioactive topic isn't it no one wants to be associated with somebody that touches up little kids um or younger girls in any way shape or form which is definitely understandable but interesting perspective from um trisha pay is again interested to hear if this does kind of trickle through into you know crystalia's uh uh space if he does kind of stumble across it and whether or not he would decide to restart his podcast because i think if he wanted to be a stand-up comedian just do his podcast i think he'd be fine i think his hollywood career is all but over i don't think that's ever going to come back unless one of the girls retracts her statement and says she lied for clout or whatever i don't think that's ever coming back that is what it is um but if he wants to be a you know a successful stand-up touring the country and the world and doing his podcast he could easily do that i think if he just restarted it again today and just kind of address the situation but working back in hollywood probably not going to happen um i don't think an interview trisha pace is a good idea <laughs> to be honest it's your first interview back but hey it, it could be a start but again let me know your thoughts and opinions what do you think do you agree with trisha pace everyone abandoned him do you understand why everyone abandoned him um did you expect more from ethan klein regarding the situation and are you waiting uh, with bated breath for Crystal Lee's return via the podcast let me know in the comments down below anyway that's the excellent English episode number 408 thanks so much for checking in as per usual it's been a blast to have your company if it's your first time checking out the show via youtube make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe leave me a comment down below if you're listening via the podcast app please give me a five star review um download the show and share it with your friends and of course support via patreon is always more than welcome there's going to be one bonus episode on patreon per week so make sure you sign up on there patreon.com for just agostino patreon.com for just agostino it's only one pound it's one dollar to sign up via patreon don't do Lay. don't be stingy sign up on there today and again i'll see you guys again very very soon until next time take care peace